Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the National Constitution Center. I am Jeffrey Rosen, the president of this wonderful institution, and it is very important for General McChrystal that all of you remind each other of our reason for being, which is that we are the only institution in America chartered by Congress to disseminate information about the US Constitution on a nonpartisan basis. Very well done. Thank you. We have an exciting series of programs coming up for our winter town hall series, including next month, uh, Intelligence Squared returns to the National Constitution Center for a debate about whether or not the social media platform should have to follow the First Amendment. And on February 4th in Washington, D.C., we're sponsoring the world premiere of Songs of the Notorious RBG, a concert of uh, 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 songs put on by Justice Ginsburg's daughter-in-law, Patrice Michaels, and it's going to have a full orchestra and school kids. If you can make it to D.C., that would be wonderful if you could join us. Uh, friends, we are here to discuss a really exciting book um, that not only changes the way we think about leadership, but also the way we think about the founders. And as you'll hear in a moment, the book was inspired by General McChrystal's hearing a lecture on the great Roman historian Plutarch. And that led to this remarkable project. It's changed the way I think about leadership and about the founders. And therefore, I'm so honored to introduce to you the former commander of US and international security assistant forces in Afghanistan, the former commander of the nation's premier military counterterrorism force, the Joint Special Operations Command, senior fellow at Yale University. Please join me in welcoming General Stanley McChrystal. Thank you. General, you were inspired to Call begin me the- Call stand, Jeff, please. Uh, no, I, no, I won't. You're, no, you're this General is McChrystal a learning here. institution, <laughs> and then so. you've got to learn. No, no, no. I think uh, 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 you were inspired to write the book, hearing David Brooks talk about Plutarch at Yale. Tell us more about that. Right. He, he gave an, a, uh, a lecture that said, who would Plutarch write about now? And um, it really raised the question of sort of who matters, because Plutarch wrote about leaders he thought that mattered, the, the 48 leaders that he paired in, in lives. The reality is I'd never read Plutarch. I knew who Plutarch was, but I was about you know, an inch deep on that. And it, it paralleled a journey that I was going on along with my two co-authors. And what had happened, we'd all been in the military. J. Mangone had been a Marine Corps infantry officer, much younger than, uh, than Jeff Eggers and I. Jeff had been a, a career SEAL still much younger than me, uh, and then I'd been in the Army for a career, and we'd all been trained as leaders, as the military makes that attempt to do it. We'd all had the opportunity to practice leadership. I, in fact, had written my memoirs and then written a second book after that. And then at age 63, I came to this stunning and somewhat disappointing conclusion. I actually didn't understand what leadership is. So, and you're thinking, how dumb is this guy? Um, all that tax money wasted and whatnot. And it, it came from a number of things. And one of it came from when I, when I got out of the military, I wasn't going to write anything. And then people come to you and say, you have a debt to history. So I wrote my memoirs. And I spent two and a half years working with a young, just recent Yale graduate uh, on my memoirs. And I, when I started, I said, how hard can this be? I mean, I was there. So I know. And so we, we started with detailed timelines. We did a hundred and some interviews of people I worked with. And what we found was my memory was pretty good. Most of the things that happened that I remembered, I was accurate on, but I was just incredibly incomplete. And what that meant was there would be an instance where I would have made a decision or taken an action and there'd be an outcome. And then, and I, therefore I, got credit or blame for the outcome. Uh, and then when we did all these interviews, we found there were all these other things happening below the waterline, other people doing things, making decisions. And my actions were not only not the direct cause for the outcome, although I probably got the credit in most cases, I was happy to take it, uh, 
the reality was I didn't even know about all this stuff until after the fact. So what I found was of my own memoirs, I'm really not even the star of the story. And that was humbling. And I really came to the conclusion that much of me as a leader, just what you just said about me in my bio was so kind, is sort of a myth. And then we started to think, okay, well, wait a minute. All the leaders that we've admired and thought about in life, or some that we, we didn't like, so much of that is actually seen through this lens of mythology, which we have been conditioned for literally millennia uh, to use when we think about leaders and, and often when we think about ourselves. So we came to this conclusion that what we really needed to do was, if we were going to understand leadership, we needed to go back to the beginning. And so we went to Plutarch. And we read Plutarch, all thousand pages of it. And we tried to get our minds around it and we felt very proud of ourselves. I would guess that this is a, a non-standard audience, but probably in an audience this size, maybe one or two people would have read Plutarch in today's world. But in reality, if we were 75 years ago, everybody would have read it. And everybody would have it on their nightstand. Theodore Roosevelt had it in his breast pocket and said, I've read it a thousand times and it is forever fresh. Alexander Hamilton took notes on it at night at Valley Forge when he had a lot of other things to do. So it was just core to thinking about leaders and how we think about ourselves and leaders. And so we went back to the beginning. We said, how are we going to get our minds around what leadership really is? Because we had great suspicion about the great woman or great man theory that people on pedestals actually are the fulcrum of history. Because our own experience had told us that that didn't feel right. So we decided to use the Plutarch model. And, and, and as Jeff and I have talked, we couldn't do 48 because we're not Plutarch. We did 13. And we went and we tried to get a diverse set of leaders so that we could really get our minds around what leadership is. And then from that, what does that mean about leaders and how should we think about it? that vision of Hamilton reading Plutarch at Valley Forge is riveting. You wrote a wonderful op-ed. It, it was published in the Philadelphia Inquirer, but the longer version I think should be published too because you really channel the founders on Plutarch. What did Hamilton take from Plutarch and what lessons did he absorb? Yeah. Um, Plutarch wrote biographies, not history. And he tried to put people into focus and he is really was thinking about virtue and so much of what Plutarch was trying to communicate was the importance of virtue in leaders and some of the, the, the people that he uh, profiled were not particularly admirable characters but he looked very hard at the importance of virtue and as we build as we lead nations or armies or organizations just how important that that became to the very essence of leadership and therefore to society. And yet, as you note in your piece, Hamilton and Madison in the Federalist Papers constructed a government on the presumption that if men were angels, no government would be necessary. Uh, but because they're not, we cannot rely on the virtue of leaders. That's exactly right. And if you look at the Constitution, and, and everyone here I know knows it backwards and forwards, and then you read the Federalist Papers, which really explain the logic behind our government, that is the entire genius of it, I think. It's the idea that if we were all purpose, or if we were all perfect, or we were all well-intentioned, or we were all self-disciplined, that you could set up a fairly sterile government that was based upon people that the better angels would guide. But the reality is we're human and we have biases and we have interests and we have different levels of ability. And so they set up this incredible system that takes into account it's going to be read, it's going to be executed by humans. And so it has this checks and balances, it has the tensions in it, it has all the things that prevent us from being taken astray by the odd, very evil, but talented person, but also from being taken astray by ourselves, our own passions at any given moment when we start to go in a different direction. And I don't think many of us think about that enough now. I don't many of us think about just how important it was, how carefully constructed 
uh, our government was to get that balance so that we could never get too far off course. And the, the uh, intent behind the, the founding fathers, I think, set that incredible foundation for us. And yet the other half of Hamilton's equation, as you note, is that without virtue, no government would be possible. And the founders are afraid of silver-tongued demagogues who, as in ancient Greece, which you read about as a young man, would play on the people's passions and lead to disaster. What is the danger of demagogues misleading the people? Well, the thing about demagogues is it works. I mean, the thing about being, as we write in our book, we, we pair two zealots, Maximilian Robespierre and Abu Musab al-Zarqawi, who led al-Qaeda in Iraq. Both of them believed desperately in their cause. Robespierre wanted a virtuous society in France, and who could be against that? And yet, in one five-week period, they guillotined 900 Frenchmen under the theory that terror was warranted if you're en route to a virtuous end. Abu Musab al-Sarqawi personally beheaded people, to include a young American named McBurg, in the spring of 2004. And yet he did it in pursuit of a caliphate that he believed deeply in. He believed in an Islamic society that reflected values that were extreme in our eyes, but were admirable in his. And so what we find is that kind of confident belief, that kind of uh, lacking in self-doubt is actually very attractive to us. If you ever been somewhere where you got a group of people and you're saying, well, what should we do? And then Jeff comes up and says, well, we need to do this. And everybody else goes, well, I don't know. He says, no, we need to do this, no doubt about it. And there's no wavering. He doesn't seem to have a, a shred of doubt. Well, suddenly you start to think, well, maybe he knows. Maybe he's right because he is so sure. And when you explode that up to a national level or, or a political level, suddenly someone with the ability to just trumpet something over and over with tremendous confidence. And they might, they might actually pick at strings that, that resonate with you. They might not if you were in a cool, dry place and you were very reasonable. But if you're in the moment and there's music playing and people are saying loud, you sort of get, okay, maybe this is right. And that happens not only to each of us, but it happens to whole societies. And the danger is it's not that hard. We see it over and over again. Slightly different versions each time. But the reality is we see it, tail gunner Joe McCarthy. He comes and he hammers on something and most people wouldn't want to have McCarthy for dinner. But the reality is he said some things that a good part of America at the time was nodding to. And so it's, it's the ability for our systems in society to sometimes protect us against ourselves. To sometimes protect us against ourselves, that is a powerful way of putting it. And you say we need not only a theory of leadership, but a followership. What do you so, mean by that? And what are the qualities of the people that can lead them to be misled as followers by demagogic leaders? Yeah, and I'm going to throw in just a little bit of personal here to, to get there. Um, in the military, one of the things you find is if you are a fairly good leader, and you don't have to be a genius at this, you can get soldiers to do almost anything. And that means you can get in front of them, that they admire you, and if you speak with confidence, they will take the hill, which is a good thing. They will also do things that are not good. And we see time and time again in history, armies can do that. And leaders can either, by doing it directly, or literally with a wink and a nod. They don't have to say to do something. They can simply give a very subtle message. I remember the message that when I was leading counter-terrorist forces, all I would have had to do was go, do what you got to do. And some of them would have interpreted that to torture prisoners, would have interpret, interpreted that that way. Not because they were evil people, but because they thought that's what I wanted. And so I found you had to be extraordinarily clear at what it is you wanted. So the fact you can take soldiers or any other group, particularly one that, that has been built into a case of team and take them somewhere, it is really, really valuable or is, is important to understand. And so when we get in places where 
you have this ability to get people, uh, it doesn't always be excited, but they, they just start to move in that direction. Then we need something that, that pulls us back. You know, there's this um, phenomenon. And I don't know if you've all ever heard the story of uh, the bus to Abilene. The military, they use this as this tale that they teach you. And the bus to Abilene is about a family. And they're, they get up Saturday. It's an extended family, like 12, 15 people. And they get together like for Sunday dinner. And someone says, well, let's go to Abilene. Let's take the bus and go to Abilene. Nobody wants to go to Abilene, and they kind of go through the backstory. Not one of them, but nobody wants the person, that, no one wants to be the person who says, no, let's not do it. And everybody else says, well, if you want to go, I'll go. You know, and so everybody's kind of getting along. They literally get to Abilene, and they realize nobody wanted to go. And, and they teach that because in military planning and other things, you start planning something and the momentum takes you in a certain direction. You don't want to be the naysayer because you want to get along. You want to be the right person. And suddenly, we used to always stop and ask ourselves, wait a minute, are we on the bus to Abilene here? And societies can get on the bus to Abilene. Mm. And you can get committed to something that you don't even want because you're already invested in your part way there. What the heck, let's continue to Ab Abilene. And I think that how do we create an environment in which it is not only okay, but it is essential for people to pull back? Where is it essential for people to go, wait a minute, what are we doing? Is this us? I think our society now, what I, the, the term I've been using lately for everyone is stop worrying about the political leaders in America. Stop agonizing over what this leader says or what that leader says. Let's all go look in the mirror. And when we look in the mirror, let's ask ourselves two questions. What are our values, our personal values? The person you're looking at, what are our values? What's important to us? What do we believe in? And then second is, what are the, we believe the values of the nation? And hopefully they're in somewhat alignment. They don't be exactly perfect, but, but hope, what are our values as a nation? Because we are not followers in the passive sense. We are shareholders. We are participants. We are vested. We are responsible. There are no leaders that get things to happen unless people participate and follow, unless we select, elect, follow, support, all of these kinds of things. And so we are responsible when that happens. We can't just say, well, you know, the devil made me do it. Look, he brought us here. The reality is we are responsible for what we do and don't do and what we as a group. And so, but that's easy for me to say sitting here today. As a, as a society, how do we have that face in the mirror moment? And we say it is fitting, appropriate, and necessary for us to go back to first principles of what our values are and what we believe in and what we are about. And I think that, I think, I don't want to blame everything on social media, that's too popular now, but we've gotten a pretty superficial conversation. Jeff and I were talking in the back uh, earlier, when's the last time you were in a very deep conversation about the values of the nation or the meaning of the Constitution, or any big issue where you got deep into the issue, and you got deep into, okay, what are we talking about here? I don't get into very many of those. When I get into them now, it's because we set them up. I get you know two or three people, and we're writing something, so we have this deep discussion. But if you're just talking about the, the latest conversation, it tends to be, did you hear what so-and-so said? Isn't that a bad thing, or isn't that a good thing, and that sort of thing. Um, and I sense that we have avoided those kinds of deep discussions. Look at presidential debates now. Look at how presidential debates are measured. They're measured by who can do the zinger, who is cleverest. And yet, my theory on presidential debates, and this, I'm going to bore you all with this, I think what we ought to do is take, if it's between two people, put one in a soundproof room, put the other out on the stage with a whiteboard, and ask them an a important, deep question, and give them 30 minutes to answer it. 
And you know, some of them would get about two minutes into it and then there'd be this agonizing silence. And then I would do it and then I would move the whiteboard out of the way. I'd bring the other person out who'd been in the soundproof room, do the same thing and let them do it. Now you don't expect everybody to be perfect on every issue, but it would avoid the opportunity to have sort of a debate where you just go, aha, you know, you sir or no John Kennedy kind of moment. Because what did that really mean? What you really want to know is what's inside the person. I don't even want to know what the person thinks about a, a particular policy issue. I want to know how they think. Because I don't want to judge them on policy issues in the past. I want to judge them on how they're going to deal with things that we don't know they're going to emerge and are going to emerge. And so how do we set up a system where we can actually get inside somebody's head? Sorry to go off on a tangent. Not, not at all. Uh, uh, this is a nonpartisan institution. You are a nonpartisan general. You have famously uh, criticized two presidents, uh, yeah. President Obama, and you were uh, you left your command because of your criticisms of him. And more recently, you were asked whether you thought our current president was immoral, and you said yes, you think yeah. he is. What did you mean by that? Yeah, let, let me go back and tell the truth on the President Obama thing. There was this article in the Rolling Stone that said. Uh, we criticized President Obama. Actually, didn't that didn't happen. What happened was this reporter was around us, and my team had been together for years, years in combat together. And we had a, a banter among us. And there was, I'm sure there were things said. I know there was one quote about you know Vice President Biden. But actually, I voted for President Obama. I was deeply loyal to him. And so when I'm in a conservative audience, people always give me great credit. They say, yeah, you told him off. No, I never did that. Um, I did tell him what I thought about the war and policy and whatnot, but I never thought President Obama was trying to do anything but what he thought was right. Same thing I thought about President George W. Bush. I disagreed with some of the policy decisions both of them made, but I thought in both cases they were trying to get it right. Um, my somewhat public comments about President Trump recently, I didn't want to say anything political because the last thing we need is generals to become political. When generals become too political, you're going to start a process that isn't really healthy for the country. Now, occasionally you can have Dwight David Eisenhower elected to the presidency, this is grand, and that's fine. But if we start thinking of our generals as Democratic generals and Republican generals, or if people enter the military thinking that this is a route to political power, we'll have a different officer corps, we'll have a different army, and we don't want that. So, you know, I really agonized over this one. Um, but I did this calculus that said, at a certain point, it was more wrong to be silent because I felt strongly enough about what had uh, transpired during the trip to Iraq when he had gotten around young soldiers, his uh, actions with uh, General Mattis and whatnot. I really just thought that we were at a point where I wasn't gonna be able to look myself in the mirror if I didn't literally come out and say what I thought. And so I did that. And I had mixed feelings about it. Um, but I, I'm comfortable with what I said. That's what I believe. And I certainly won't backtrack from that. But I, like you say, I, I would like to think of myself as nonpartisan. What did you mean when you said he was immoral? Yeah. I probably misspoke. I think he's probably more akin to amoral. I don't think um, by his behaviors, I've never met the man, I don't think his behaviors reflect the, the reason behind his decision as ever being anything but what is best for he as an individual. And I think many politicians have a big self-serving part in them. I'm not saying that, you know, that they don't. And I think, and I know that many politicians and people on all walks of life aren't always completely truthful. They certainly shade the truth. But I think in this case, what President Trump has done is he has uh, lowered the tone of American political discourse. I think he has 
pulled a lot of honorable people away from their better angels, and they're responsible too. Um, I think he has cheapened the word of the United States. And, and I think that it is um, unfortunate. And I think we're responsible. It, this is a collective responsibility. It's not, we can't sit back here and go through and just screwed up. It's his fault. We, I mean, we own this thing. You've studied leadership. What category of leader would you put him in? And do you think he's a demagogue? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's an interesting question because I've been asked that. Uh, I don't think that he is a zealot from the standpoint of having a deep belief and being willing to do anything for it. Because my sense is his belief is more superficial. His belief is more about what, what benefits him in the short term. I don't believe he has a deep ideology. I don't think he's a conservative or a liberal or a, a fascist or whatever. I don't think he's any of those. I think he is, uh, I don't know, maybe a political opportunist, but he's remarkably good communicator. He understands communication in a way that is visceral. He repeats things, he says them clearly, we build a wall as an extraordinarily clear statement. It's a mental picture you draw, and it can mean whatever you want. Make America Great Again was one of the best slogans anyone's ever come up with. It's an operable active verb, make, do something. America, which is emotional term for the United States. If you say United States, it's sort of legal. If you say America, it's in your gut. Great. Everybody gets to define great the way they want to. They get to decide what that is, and they get to go back to whatever period in history they think was great again. If he said, make the United States 1954, <laughs> then people could have been against it. Make America great again. You go back to your favorite day in America, and he's saying, that's what we're going to do. And it just... It, by the way, is also what Adolf Hitler used in 1921. Now, I'm not comparing Donald Trump to Adolf Hitler. There's a vast difference. But what you do is when you're communicating something, the mental image you can create in the receiver is hugely important. And so the ability to get that kind of thought out and just keep hammering it you know, don't, let's not get too specific. What do you want? We'll make America great again. Who could be against that? I mean, really. We'd all like America to be great, and we all probably think there was a time in our minds when it was better than it is now. So in that way, it's genius. Is there an analog in American history? Um, there are probably a number of people uh, you know, we go to Joe McCarthy, we go to Father Conklin in the 1920s, early 30s. Um, I don't know if there's one in the modern era that is quite as effective as, as he has been with it. But I also think he's not, he is not uh, a phenomenon that came and changed American history. He arrived and, and got in front of a parade that had already formed up and was starting to move. People already were frustrated with the elites for some good reasons. The elites took us into Vietnam and that turned out not to be the, what we wanted. The housing crisis, there are a whole bunch of things that average Americans could go, you know, I don't think we've really been well governed. And then in, in income inequality and things like that. And then there are other things that weren't easily controlled globalization and whatnot. When we studied for the book, we studied Martin Luther, the Protestant Reformation. You think Martin Luther changed the Catholic Church. Actually, he got in front of a movement that was bubbling, and he stepped in front of it at just the right moment. 
Boss Tweed didn't create Tammany. He didn't create corruption. He perfected it. Martin Luther King Jr. led the civil rights movement. He didn't create it. He built upon what other people like Gandhi had done philosophically. He got in a civil rights movement that after World War II was trying to move forward. And he got and he gave shape and he gave rhetoric to it. He gave a vision to it. And this is time and again. And I think President Trump intersected with a moment with a bunch of factors came together and he intersected and he happened to have a celebrity personality from reality TV. He had this ability to communicate and it intersected and I think it probably survived, surprised him as much as it has other people. That comparison to Martin Luther and Martin Luther King is interesting. Your chapter on both of them calls them the reformers and said that they were accidental leaders who found these two movements. Here you say, that the president found a different movement almost by accident. So is it whether the movement is virtuous or not that determines whether or not the leader is? Well, I, I think in many cases, that's exactly what happens. Um, now you have people with good values. Dr. Martin Luther King was raised with extraordinary values. Martin Luther was this incredibly pious priest before he turned against the Catholic Church. Um, so they, they were of the moment. They were of the society that they were trying to change. They were part of it so that they, they understood it deeply. Um, Abu Musab al-Zarqawi was a fairly uneducated young Jordanian who got imbued with his extremist ideology and then became a leader of al-Qaeda, specifically al-Qaeda in Iraq. He fell in on the thinking and the movement that was there, and he grabbed it. I used to, people would come visit my forces in Iraq, and they'd say, describe al-Qaeda, because they are pretty extreme people. And I'd start by doing a straight line. I'd go, okay, here one end. Here are the Delta Force and SEAL Team 6 operators, the professionals that I lead, the best we got. Here's at the other end of the spectrum, the al-Qaeda best operatives they've got. You want to look at it like a spectrum. Good over here, really focused. Effective, but bad people over here. But it wasn't like that. It was actually like this. It was, I'd bend it up on the whiteboard. I'd do it like this. And I said, the difference between these Al-Qaeda operatives and my best people, is pretty small. They both want to be a part of something. They both believe deeply in their cause. They're both are willing to sacrifice for their cause. Deep uh, loyalties, and it's who recruited them, and what value set they were given at some point in their life. When they didn't, they weren't fully formed individuals who looked and studied and then chose a, a value set. They reflect values that they get through their lives, and then they fall in on those and, and they go forward. Most of us that, that practice of religion don't study comparative religion and then choose one. We are raised in a religion and then we believe it. And so, I think that understanding that uh, people reflect the values and the situation they're around and they're shaped by is huge. I think uh, President Trump doesn't have a deep set of those. And he, he came in upon this and was extraordinarily adaptable. That's a remarkable comparison to your soldiers and the Al-Qaeda zealots. Back to Hamilton, it sounds like the need for constitutions is all the more important to separate powers and have checks and balances. What are the responsibility of leaders in Congress and the judiciary to check leaders who may not be virtuous? Yeah, I, well, it's huge. I mean, we ultimately, in the ballot box, have the biggest responsibility. We, we don't subcontract it to uh, just our elected leaders at other levels. But I think several things. First, I think the Constitution must first and foremost be something that it's living. It can be changed if, if it needs to be. But it needs to be something we understand, we focus, and we consider sacred. Because it's a statement of the values we want to have in our governance. That's all it is. It's a statement of what we want our governance to produce and how we're going to do that. I think that our elected officials then have a responsibility to understand that this is the rules of the game. 
Any of you who've played sports, and I'm sure everyone here did, know that if you go out to play basketball and you play in a league and it's well uh, policed by referees, it's more fun than if you're playing on a sandlot and there's nobody stopping anybody from fouling, people are going out. Because once people start breaking the rules to a certain point, it stops being fun. It's funny at first, but then it stops being fun because there's just not a, a way to do the game fairly. And so the Constitution frames the playing field. It frames the rules. We are players, but we're also referees. We are people who play, but we also, when somebody fouls, have to go, wait a minute, that's a foul, stop it. If we keep doing that, this won't be a good game anymore. And so I think that our elected officials have a deep responsibility to the Constitution and the game. Remember, the game is more important than the players, ultimately. They have that responsibility, but it's always a tension because there are personal self-interest, there are ideological passions, and, and we have got to make sure that, that that respect for the game and the institution is so great, and the rules for getting outside it so strong that we, we keep people coming back, uh, back into it. And we're in a period now where th that's been weakened a bit. I think people know it, and hopefully people will pull back to it, but it's been weakened a bit. It has been weakened, and one of the things that led you to speak out was your concern that the military was being politicized. What do we do in an age when our institutions, the military, the courts, the Congress, and the presidency are being delegitimized? Yeah. We gotta fight back. I mean, they have to be, uh, they have to internally, the military itself, the courts themselves, have got to be incredibly sensitive about retaining their legitimacy by their nonpartisan nature. I mean, they've just gotta be draconian. When I was in the military, you didn't know, if I'm talking senior now, you didn't know what generals were liberal and conservative. You never talked about it. You didn't talk about it in meetings. You didn't talk about it at parties. That was just considered a foul. And because it, you know, the last thing you'd want to do is have a situation where you've got a boss who's got one political persuasion and they, you know, they pressure you or something in another way. So it just didn't happen. And so that kind of uh, situation has to continue. Some of the things that have weakened a little bit uh, social media makes it easier in off hours to people to put stuff out there and then people start to know so-and-so's out there doing that. Not a lot of active duty, but some are doing it and some spouses do it. And You know, I, I think the idea that you have a right to vote, you have a responsibility to vote in the military, I believe. I'm not one of the people who says that the military shouldn't vote because they're part of the democracy. But I think We've got to be very careful, just like your religious beliefs. If I'm a very religious officer, I shouldn't have all my, my leaders come to Bible training because one who doesn't believe in that feels pressured. And if somebody else gets promoted, they think it's because they believe in, you know, they're sort of in my in crowd. Same with politics. We've got to be really, uh, really hard on that. But it's got, to be a, it's got to be written rules, but also unwritten rules as well. That's a profound point. Should soldiers not tweet? I don't think it's helpful. You know, as I tell people, I think tweeting is fine, as long as you're not operating a motor vehicle or trying to lead the most powerful nation in the free world. <laughs> <laughs> or, or fight for it, as you say, and maintaining the boundaries between the public and private is important for all of us, even as citizens. Well, I mean, think about what tweeting is about. If I tweet and say, I went and had lunch here and it was great hamburgers, all right. That's not a big deal. Now, if I'm a very senior general and I go have lunch somewhere and I say really good hamburgers, did I just endorse that place? Got to be a little careful of that. The problem is, in a short number of characters, you try to explain what you think about something. First, I ask the question, who cares what you think, what you had for lunch, you know? The, the second is, what are you trying to do with it? Are you trying to attack somebody? Are you trying to convince people? What's the point of it? 
And so we're sort of in this period um, where we start tweeting out things and we're not quite sure why. There's marketing tweets, I get that, and there are you know, other things like that, but I, I just worry that we're not sure what we're trying to accomplish, and it's really hard to have a, make a reasoned argument in a very small number of, of uh, characters. One of your, several of your leadership lessons turn on communications. Let your guard down strategically. Communication should be your key priority. Watch your communications etiquette and use commander's intent, especially in times of crisis, own your failings, stay fit. Talk about the communications etiquette and it relates to the tweeting. Why is that an important part of leadership? Yeah. Um, I learned a lot of things when we started to get more digital when I was in command. And one of them was in email before, before tweeting. I would send an email to somebody, a boss or someone else, and I'd, I'd spell out this whole email and I'd get back two letters, okay. And I remember I'd get, I still get angry if someone writes okay in an email to me. Because okay can mean a lot of things. It can be okay, great, you know, boom. It can mean I'm so important I can only send okay. You wrote me this whole email, but I'm just gonna write okay. Or it can also mean whatever. And I was very sensitive to that because if a junior person wrote me an email and I said okay, I'd never get another email from them because they think they'd bother me and I'd just you know, kind of done that. So particularly to junior people, you had to write back, hey, you know, Sergeant so-and-so, thanks for your email, that's a great idea, suggestion. You know, we're probably gonna do that in February when hell freezes over. But thanks for your idea. <laughs> uh, but, but then I'd get thank yous for the response because you take the time not to do something. So etiquette in that is really important. Um, you'll find that you can send unintended, unintended messages through very short things uh, that may not at all be what you, what you meant. Um, I, got a, I got a text this morning from one of my co-authors, and he said, I want to invite X person to this conference we're having in our, at our company, and you got any issues with that? And I sent him one back, I said, absolutely not. I've talked to two of our other partners and they agree with me. And he sent me a note back, he says, okay, I'll hold off. <laughs> and I sent him a note back, I said, no, 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 Jeff, here's what I meant, absolutely no problem with it, it's a great idea. <laughs> but here, two educated guys, and we get completely different meaning just because how you interpret and so became really, really important. Communications etiquette, I think of Washington and his etiquette manuals about how to behave in public and also his insistence on boundaries. He did not like it when people slapped him on the back. We talk about the challenges of leadership in an age when those formalities and roles are under siege. Yeah, um, George Marshall, when he was chief of staff of the army, never had Franklin Roosevelt, his president, call him by his first name. And Franklin Roosevelt, kind of called everybody by their first name. And General Marshall just sort of, I'm not quite sure he did it, but he signaled back, that's not good. And it wasn't because, Marshall was kind of a stiff guy, it wasn't because he didn't like the president. He thought that that was going to change the relationship. And the relationship between he and the president had to be between the president and the chief of staff of the army. That was the relationship that mattered, not between George and Franklin. And that's a very interesting thing. We're in an era now where we think that first names are very important and familiarity is very important and backslapping is important. And I'm not against those things. I'm not quite sure where I come down. But I do know that sometimes we confuse the issue. Sometimes we let either an attempt to be very familiar or an attempt to be falsely friends with someone. We take a little bit of the business-like part out of it. And sometimes I think that can muddy up the message. I think sometimes the message has to be very businesslike. And it can be, you can care deeply about the person, but there are things about which there should be rules and boundaries. You know, one of the things you learn in the military is you have subordinates that are around you a lot. And when you're in combat, they're around you 
damn near 24 hours a day. And you go through ups and downs and you get scared, you get frustrated, you go through everything a human does. And there's this temptation to get to your closest subordinates and sort of pour your heart out. Let me tell you my problems, let me tell you my frustrations. But it's not fair because you change the relationship because one evening you're pouring your heart out and you sort of stand to whoever. And then the next day, it's very businesslike and you gotta, you gotta give them really hard response to something. And you changed it suddenly and it's extraordinarily confusing to them. And they're trying to figure, what do you want? Do you want me to be your buddy? Do you want me to be this? Set the ground rules. And it's the same reason why you know, we, we always had separate officer and NCO clubs because you didn't want to drink alcohol with people who you're then going to have to be you know, disciplining. It's just, it's not because you don't like people. It's not because you, you know, you're a stick in the mud. It's because those rules actually exist to make it easier for everyone. There are ground rules. Like parents, your kids don't want you to be their best buds. They want you to be your parents, their parents. And I think that it's important that we remember that. You see why I insisted on calling you general. <laughs> <laughs> I've been called worse. Once, this is such an interesting insight you're sharing with us. Once we lose these boundaries between public and private and start personalizing our offices, is that what results in greater polarization? And is that why you're concerned about the politicization of the military? You become loyal to the person, not to the, not to the office. That's an interesting question. There's always a loyalty to individuals that just grows naturally. I, I, it, it shifts pretty easily in most cases. The new commander comes in and people shift loyalties. Just, but there are still affections and loyalties that are, are maintained for a lifetime sometimes. Um, but I think you need to make sure people understand the first loyalties to the institution, to the Constitution of the United States and the institution of, of the Army or whatever you're a part of. Then your loyalty is to the person in a job you are loyal to the commander or to the judge or whatever. And then there's a loyalty to an individual, which takes longer to build. But that loyalty to the individual is subordinate to all the others. It has to be because you swore an oath and that's, that's what you're doing. I think that um, we, sometimes, uh, we sometimes confuse those and we let people get confused about them. Um, it's not a great answer to your question, but that's, that's kind of as far as my mind takes it. <coughs> it's, it. It's the nature of celebrity. Celebrity is someone we have the illusion of being familiar with. You can't lead, you can't, <coughs> whereas authority, according to Max Weber, yeah. requires a sense of mystery, of distance, of impersonality. And that's what social media is undermining. I think that's very true. It, it, you know, if you think about it, you, if someone lets you into their life in every way, shows you, you know, happy snaps of everything that they do, it's harder to have that kind of distance and mystique. Um, and so I think that there's a danger in that. I'm a believer in transparency. I think there's, in the sense that I think a leader should explain to people what they are trying to do. They should explain, and I used to call it thinking out loud. When we were gonna give an instruction, what I, would, what I learned to do, particularly digitally, when you're doing video teleconferences with a large group of people, you say, okay, here's the issue, here's how I process it, here are my conclusions, and here's what I think we ought to do about it. And the reason I did that is I wanted them to follow the whole logic train, and if it was wrong, to say so. Because if I just announced, here's what we're gonna do about something, sort of the Sphinx speaking, and they don't know how I got there, sometimes they could assume that I've got some clever rationale for why I got there, and they just don't know it. But if they see I'm an idiot and I just took it this whole way, they can go, stop. And I think that that's important. And, and an organization where there's enough transparency to that, I, that part, I think, is healthy. We have so many questions. I'm, you can tell I'm reluctant to end this part of the conversation. And I want to get to them now. So let me do that. But as I'm doing that, uh, just to make sure you've gotten the basic message of the book, I know you're asked all the time to condense it, you know, the takeaways. Yeah. What, 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 what do you want people to know about leadership? What surprised you and, and, and what are the lessons that you want to convey? Sure, where, where we got on this is we, 
we came to the conclusion that leadership has been looked at through these three myths, we call it. The first is a formulaic myth, the idea that you have a list of behaviors or traits and you're going to be a good leader. When we study the leaders, you can have all those traits be completely ineffective. You can have very few of them and be very effective. So there's no correlation. The second is that the leader is the reason an organization fails or doesn't fail. And when we study that, we find that's not the real reason either. The leader's a factor, but they are typically not the, the major variable in that. Although, because we put the spotlight on them, we tend to draw that conclusion. And the last is that we are a very discerning followership and we demand leaders who produce results. We demand CEOs who make money, coaches who win, generals who triumph on the battlefield, and actually we don't. Actually, we follow and support leaders who are serial failures in many cases and discard leaders who actually get great results. They feel there's, a, there's an almost un, um, a poorly understood interaction between leaders and followers that they feel part of our need and it's not based on results. And so it's, it's curious. We, we don't think leadership is a thing that leaders have or don't have. We think leadership is an emergent property from the interaction of leaders, followers, and contextual factors, almost like a chemical reaction. It's always contextual, it's constantly changing, and it's incredibly complex. And so the punchline of the book is that there is no easy answer to leadership. There's not a set of things you can do. There's not a secret to it. The secret is how complex it is. But the complexity is on the follower side as well. And the whole issue of the agency that followers have for this is so much more important than we sometimes uh, give. Um, so many great, first of all, thank you for that wonderful summary and for the insights. And we have a bunch of great questions, sure. uh, a bunch on the questions in the news, which everyone sure. is wondering about. Your thoughts on using troops on the southern border. Uh, you've criticized the president in Syria. What should be the next move in Syria? And your thoughts comparing the military's regard for President Obama versus President Trump. Sure. Um, troops on the southern border, um, I am not convinced we have an emergency on the southern border. Now we have an issue we got to work through. We need immigration reform. Do we need a wall? I'm not expert enough to say we drew doubt. We need immigration reform, and every nation must be able to control its borders. Those are sort of too obvious. I, I think the using of troops on the border, if they're really needed to, to build things and all, I wouldn't be against that. But in this particular case, we need to understand that sending troops to the border sent an international message. It sent a message internally, but it sent an international message as well. And I don't think that was healthy. That was sort of like everybody go defend the walls of the Alamo, and I don't think that's the message that we really want to send. So, you know, it's, we certainly got to deal with our borders and we got to do better with immigration and all, but I just, that was not the way I wish we had done it. Um, the second one was Syria. Syria is in a bad way, in, an, in a uh, part of the world that's in a bad way. Uh, we did, we've done some great things in the Mideast and we've made some colossal mistakes in the Mideast. So we are part of the problem, but we are absolutely part of the solution. We are necessary for the solution. Uh, and I would say that if the United States pulls out completely, we lose our vote. We lose our ability to influence. It's not nice. It's not fun to stay there. It's not, no, it's not the military trying to stay there because we like being at war or anything like that. It is because we understand that the world is now smaller and engagement is important. Face-to-face -face engagement, being part of it. Uh, because we have some responsibility for the situation as is, I think we need to understand we need to be some part of the solution. And if we don't, I think in the near term, the, the Russians and the Iranians and the Turks, uh, particularly in their focus on the Kurds, could produce a lot of really bad outcomes. And a lot of people will have a, a bad. But if you think longer term, just think we need to be involved in the world. That's, that's my sense. You know, I, I don't call myself a globalist, but I think the world is a place where, you know, everybody's responsible for a little bit of everybody else. 
uh, because this is a nonpartisan institution, I'll let you dodge the last uh, question, which uh, uh, was about um, President Obama versus President yeah. Trump. Um, uh, here's a question on a chapter that means a lot to you. Uh, do you think General Lee's failure openly to support Reconstruction was a failure of leadership? You changed your mind about General Lee. Why was that? Um, many of you probably know this story. I, I grew up in Northern Virginia. Was, my father was in the Army. My grandfather was in the Army. All my brothers. So military family. I grew up near Robert E. Lee's home. I went to Stonewall Jackson Elementary School. I went to Washington Lee High School. I then went to... West Point following Robert E. Lee. And when I was a second lieutenant, my wife gave me this cheap $25 painting of General Lee in his Confederate uniform. And for 40 years, we kept it on the wall of every set of quarters we lived in, and I treasured it. One, because he reflected to me almost the perfect general. Brilliant on the battlefield, courageous, non-political, courteous, all those things. And that was the view I had from him of him, and I just sort of separated him in, in any political things. Then after Charlottesville, my wife, we've been married 42 years, and she came to me and she goes, I think you need to get rid of the picture. And I said, no, I'm not gonna get rid of the picture. You gave it to me. She says, no, nope, that's not good enough. And I said, why? He's apolitical, he's not a political figure, he's a general. And she says, well, you may think that, and even he may think that, but people who come in our house won't know that. And they may think that you're trying to communicate support for something, white supremacy, which you don't believe in. So we discussed it slash argued a month. <laughs> Finally, on a Sunday morning, I went upstairs, took it off the wall, took it out to the trash binder house and threw it away. Now, when I was throwing it away, I wasn't just giving, throwing away what Annie had given me. I was throwing away something that I'd held on to as one of my heroes for my lifetime. And... It was a really tough decision to make because at West Point, Lee is not the person you try to be. Nobody can be Robert E. Lee. He's too good. Went four years, one of only six cadets to get zero demerits. I didn't do that. Um, yeah. Then he went through this career where he performed brilliantly for 32 years and then in the spring of 1861, he supports his state. Virginia, and I had sort of accepted that. And then he fought this lost cause against overwhelming odds and almost won but lost and then quietly went into retirement. But when I really studied more of it, what I really learned and when I thought more about it, in the spring of 1861, he decided to go with his state, but he was a big boy. He wasn't a 19-year-old kid. He was a 56-year-old man. He made the decision to give his vote to his state. Says, whatever Virginia does, if you secede, I'll go with you. If you stay in the United States, I'll go with you. I'll stay there. So he gave his vote away. And he gave his vote away on the biggest issue of the 19th century in the, in the United States. And when Virginia decided to secede, he went to Virginia and then eventually the Confederacy. He broke his oath, the same one I'd made on the plane at West Point, he tried to destroy the army and the nation that not only he'd been a part of, but also which his hero, George Washington, had done so much to found. And there's no getting around it. He did it for the maintenance of slavery. I don't think he was an evil guy. I still have a lot about Robert E. Lee that I admire, that I wish I was like. But I don't think he's a statue anymore. I don't think he's this iconic figure, I think he's a man. I think he's a human being. I think he's flawed. I think he's just like you, just like me. Made, at a, at a critical moment of his life, made an incredibly bad decision and paid for it for the rest of his life. And I think that caused me to step back and think about leaders. If Robert E. Lee can be human and flawed, everybody can be. And I think that that's the way I process it now. And so I think it's really important on sort of my journey of thinking about leadership. It's you're going to get some things wrong. And you just, you know, you, you try to fix it later. And he really didn't fix it later in the post-war period after the Civil War. There were times when he did. There were times when he really rose up and he was extraordinarily mature. And there were times when he sort of let the anger out. Uh, but 
but he was human. This last question is important. It's about uh, how does a good leader break groupthink to avoid getting on the wrong bus, to use your metaphor. And if you'll allow me, General, I'd just like to take this moment to ask uh, the audience to pay tribute to the blessed memory of Jack Bogle, who died yesterday. Jack, Jack Bogle was the founding chairman of the National Constitution Center. This institution would not exist without his leadership and vision. Warren Buffett said, uh, if uh, a statue were erected of someone who did more than anyone else in America to improve the life of the American investor, it would be Jack Bogle. And Jack Bogle learned his leadership from a failure. He was running a, a hedge fund, an investor's fund, and wanted to be conservative and was pushed to take risks uh, against his best judgment to beat the average and took a, uh, a big hit. And based on that, he invented the idea of the mutual fund instead just sticking to the S&P 500 and taking average returns is going to do you best in the long run and will bring down fees to nothing. And as a result, uh, Vanguard is now uh, one of the largest uh, funds in the world. And he, was, he loved the Constitution and the Constitution Center. And for Jack, uh, his love for prudent, wise, restrained investing was connected to his insistence that we all restrain ourselves as citizens and through uh, self-control and civic virtue express our allegiance to the Constitution. That's why he founded the Constitution and the Constitution Center. And if you could just take a moment, let's just think about all of the light spread by Jack Bogle and give thanks for it. And with that light and the, the example of that great leader, and there are so many others, where we, it's a great note on which to end. How does a good leader break through root think to avoid getting on the wrong bus? Yeah. Um, Franklin Roosevelt said a good leader can't get too far ahead of their followers. And if you think about it, if an organization or a group of people are trying to go in one direction and they feel strongly about it and the leader just says, no, you're all stupid, boom, 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 we're going this way, they can find themselves sort of cut off pretty quickly. I think the good leader must first be able to convince the group that they, that leader is invested with the group and the group's well-being. Sometimes the good leader has got to say, if you want to run off the cliff with all the lemmings and that's what we decide to do, I'm going. I'm going with you because I'm part of this. Then the leader, what I found is best is try to explain, however, there is another way we can go at this. Over, you know, if, if this is the, first, the leader's first interaction with the group, it's really hard to do that because the leader hasn't built up the legitimacy and the track record and whatnot. But if the leader is the kind of person who time and again has proven reasonable, well-intentioned, loyal, and all those things, but says, in this case, I think we need to do differently, what I have found is those leaders in those moments have extraordinary gravitas. And then you go, now here's a person who always thinks and always does that kind of thing. Um, and I, I didn't know this before, but there's this psychological phenomenon. If somebody tries to reason you out of a strongly held position, it typically does not work. What it does is it strengthens your position. It makes you more, have you ever fight with your spouse? I argue most strongly when I'm completely wrong and I know it. <laughs> you know, but, but that happens in mass. And so simply saying you're stupid, boom, 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 here, follow me, doesn't work. It, it has to be far more subtle. It has to be built on a lot of things. And then sometimes the leader has got to say, listen, we've been with me before. This time I'm asking you to trust me. I'm asking you to do this. And I, I found that will work if you build up the track record. But if you haven't built a track record, then it's really a tough place to be. For all he has done to illuminate our understanding of leadership in America, please join me in thanking General McChrystal.